Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Busco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. All right, welcome to Freestyle Friday where I get to do what I want. Time for more how the sausage or wine is made videos. No BS, just straight talk about how wine is made. I'm going to strip away the romance and pull back the curtain, if you will. Be that anonymous magician that shows you how the magic trick is made. Not to put down how wine is made or shame anyone. This is just reality. All right, you ever see that person at the store that asks for something organic or natural, yet they are obviously not fully invested in this concept? Drinking that Diet Coke from a plastic bottle, eating that national brand whatever, wearing clothing with another national brand that may have some questionable practices. You know, basically everyone, I can mean not everyone. We all have something that we may compromise on when it comes to these things because that's just the way it is, or there aren't any other choices, or you just like it. Yes, I personally know some people that are really close at practicing what they preach 100%, and I love them for it. As I mentioned in my farming overview episode, these shows are in response to the healthier, cleaner, or natural wine ads I've been seeing for months. Today's show is going to go a bit more in depth on the most widely used but somewhat declining method of farming. It is known as intensive or conventional or just plain old regular farming. So what we know as conventional farming had its earliest beginnings in what is known as mechanized farming at about 1700 with Jethro Tull's seed drill. And you thought Jethro Tull was a guy who plays flute in a rock band, silly goose. Well, the flute guy's name is Ian Anderson, and the band's name is Jethro Tull. For you young whippersnappers who don't know Jethro Tull, be sure to check them out. Anyway, the seed drill allowed seeds to be planted at regular intervals and depth. It also reduced waste and increased crop yields. Shortly afterwards, other developments came along. The next big thing what is what we know today as the combine or the combine harvester in the 1880s. This combined two functions, threshing and reaping. Now, reaping had been mechanized about 80 years earlier, but never really took off until much later. About 20 years later, the first tractor and other farm equipment came along with the advent of the internal combustion engine. All of these advances reduced the need for human and animal powered labor. So costs went down, efficiencies went up, and yields increased. All of that which leads to profit. And that, my friends, is Business Economics 101. We're done. No, we're not. All right. <clears throat> that romantic and beautiful vineyard you see in the pictures, those aren't grapevines. Those are dollar signs. Don't forget that a vineyard and a winery are a business at the end of the day. A fun and, yes, a romantic and seductive business, but still a business. Anyway, also in the 1800s, the idea of a chemical fertilizer came about. For thousands of years, organic materials, including manure, was used as a fertilizer. The 1850s is where a lot of the first chemical fertilizers were developed. This continued into the early 1900s when a couple of ways to make synthetic fertilizers were invented. These are pretty much the basis of what is used today. Post-World War II is where we saw a dramatic increase in the use of nitrogen-based fertilizers. The connection here, as mentioned in an article from the University of Nebraska I've linked to, is that nitrogen is a key component in explosives. After the war, the need to make these explosives was replaced with the need to restore food supplies in Europe and the US. Enter synthetic nitrogen-based fertilizers. So the obvious purpose of a fertilizer is to, is to provide a boost in the fertility of a soil. The major elements that soil needs for agriculture are nitrogen, Phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. Yes, evil sulfur. I'll have a future episode in a few months about sulfur. There are also some trace elements that are needed. Iron, manganese, copper, zinc, boron, and molybdenum. I think it's about the only time I'm going to say that. So molybdenum. 
Ooh, I think I said it right. Anyway, each of these elements play a part in vine health. Some are more critical than others. The abundance of these elements widely varies depending on the soil and the part of the world you're in. So having the right kind of fertilizer is important in how much it's applied. Too much of a good thing is possible and you don't want toxic levels as far as the vine is concerned in the soil. Using fertilizers allows you to supplement what the vines naturally take out of the soil. Since we are talking about a type of agriculture called monocropping or creating a monoculture, the soil doesn't have the opportunity to recover as much as it would if the technique of crop rotation was used. With crop rotation, you rotate it between multiple crops, typically two to four crops. This number may often be inclusive of letting the land lay fallow or implanted to a crop. It's not barren, but instead something like grass is planted for a season. This idea came about in the 1600s. The benefit is that there is a reduction in the need for synthetic fertilizers and herbicides. It can also improve the soil structure and organic matter, which reduces erosion and increases farm, systems re farm system resilience. One of the other issues is runoff. Nitrogen and phosphorus are the biggest issues environmentally. Both can negatively affect water bodies. This may include what is called eutrophication. That in turn can create hypoxia or dead zones where oxygen levels are too low for fish. You can also get larger growths of harmful algae, which also reduce oxygen in water. In addition, excess nitrogen in the air creates issues with the production of ammonia and ozone. Speaking of runoff, let's talk water. Water is life, period. Without water, there is no life on earth. Luckily for us, wine growing requires less water than many other crops. Now that doesn't mean no water, just less. On average, as long as an area receives at least 500 millimeters or 19.7 inches of annual rainfall, that is enough for viticulture without the need for irrigation. Now, according to National Geographic, a desert is an area that receives less than guess what, 500 millimeters or 19.7 inches of rain a year. So you can see that vineyards can survive in fairly arid conditions. You can find examples of viticulture in areas with less rainfall than this, but the grapevines are probably in a situation where they can get enough groundwater or moisture from the air to not need irrigation or need very little irrigation. Let's set something straight here right now, dry farming. It's a general rule Wines from the EU are technically dry farmed. Each country has its own regulations concerning irrigation in relation to wine growing. Prior to 2007, it was forbidden to irrigate with very, very few exceptions. That was changed in 2007 after a devastatingly dry 2003 and 2005. Further amendments happened since then. Now here's the deal. And this is a generalization. Irrigation is still forbidden unless there has not been sufficient rainfall in an area to support the vine. If this is the case, then there has to be approval by the country's governing body to allow irrigation. Additionally, irrigation can only happen during a set time period. Now, this normally ends well before harvest, but it can be allowed up to until harvest. They will also dictate when irrigation can start. Up until recently, you couldn't have underground irrigation, but now you can. Okay, so if irrigation has been approved for that vintage, then you can't have a yield higher than what the minimum yield for the area. In other words, irrigation can only be used in order to keep you legally compliant to the wine laws under which you are going to make that wine. It gets you to the minimum and nothing more. For example, if you irrigated but you exceeded the yield allowed in what is known as an AOP or an AOC in France, you would need to drop down to the next quality level like IGP. Think of going down from Bordeaux to IGP Atlantique. The upshot is that in Europe, you don't have vast swaths of vineyards where irrigation runs rampant. What about the rest of the world? Well, yes, these vast swaths of irrigation exist, especially in desert areas near rivers. One area well known for this is the Murray-Darling area along the Victoria and New South Wales border in Australia, mate. You're looking at this area right now, at least you should be, this is a clip of Google Earth Pro footage I'll be using in Psalm School Advanced. So the confluence of two major rivers, the Murray and the Darling, created a vast agricultural area that depends on irrigation. It's not just vines. It's a massive area. Keep checking it out along with the Riverina region in New South Wales in the next clip while I continue.
In general, wine growers are only going to irrigate as much as is necessary in order to provide the desired quality of grapes. Basically like I talked about for the EU. For bulk wine, they'll let the grapes take as much water as they want. Grapes are like dogs when it comes to food. Grapes will drink until they are bursting. Not literally, but they will take as much as you give them. This is why rainfall at harvest is bad for quality. You have natural dilution of the juice, which increases yields. It's not that all bulk wine, or value wine as I call it, is heavily irrigated. It's just that in order to get the yields required to make it profitable, to produce that $8 or even that $5 bottle of wine, irrigation is usually a factor. My prior Free Sale Friday episodes about why wine costs what it does gives an in-depth explanation of this, so you should check them out. Let's also be clear and mention that irrigation isn't exclusive to conventional farming. It's present in organic and biodynamic as well. In the case of these two, it's typically done only when necessary. So I've touched upon a couple aspects of irrigation. Ensure you have a good crop, that's a good thing, and higher yields. That's a mixed bag depending on what the circumstance is. Irrigation also allows more consistency of grape quality. This is important for wine in general. Your higher quality wines should show some vintage variation and irrigation can dilute that. So no dude, that $7 Cali Cab from 2018 really didn't taste any different than the 2017. That was all power suggestion from people like me that talk about the importance of vintage. That's yet another future episode like sometime next year. We want consistency, especially in certain kinds of products and a $7 bottle of wine needs to be consistent to 99% of the people drinking it. The people that drink higher tier wines also want consistency, but not in tasting the same every year, but in quality. Though I'll argue that even for many of those people, they really do want the wine to essentially taste the same every year. Okay, so yes, irrigation provides consistency in relation to getting a crop every year and being able to dial in a quality level of your grapes. What about the downside? Well, water usage. The more vineyards, and by extension, the more crops overall, the more water that is necessary. If you add more people and animals to the equation, then you have more mouths to hydrate. As long as the water source can supply it, you're golden, man. But what if there's a drought for like one, two, three, five or more years? These are real issues facing us today in places like California and other parts of the Western US. Australia and South Africa have experiences too, on and off over the past 10 years. Cape Town almost literally ran out of water. Literally almost ran out of water in 2018. They had to have farmers who owned a private reservoir in a neighboring district redirect water from that reservoir to one of the many that supply Cape Town. Crazy. So irresponsible irrigation, not so good. Responsible irrigation is. Next, we are going to talk about the gang of sides. The three big are herbicides, fungicides, and insecticides. These are all grouped under the broader category of pesticides. There are a few more, but these are the most common ones I encountered in my studies and conversations with winemakers or wine growers. Now, before you break out in hives at the mention of these things, we've been using pesticides for thousands of years, but like most of conventional farming, the use of synthetic pesticides didn't become widespread until really after World War II. Hmm. We created chemicals to kill people in the first two world wars. No more global conflict, but lots of chemicals. Let's see what else we can kill. Sounds familiar to the history of fertilizers. This is an oversimplification of what happened and I'm not claiming that the military industrial complex was looking for a way to keep the money flowing, but there is a connection between research into pesticides and chemical weapons. See the New York Times article from 1984 in the description. Note that the Times only allows 10 free articles a month. So if you've reached that maximum, there's actually ways around it, but you can also be a subscriber. So I'm not blowing pesticides up your stoma. Anyway, I don't know if that's even a good thing right there. Anyway, post-World War II is where the rise of many things chemical or synthetic happened, pretty much in all industries. What do these actually do? Well, let's quote from Wikipedia on that. Pesticides are used to control organisms that are considered to be harmful or pernicious to their surroundings. For example, they are used to kill mosquitoes that can transmit potentially deadly diseases like West Nile virus, yellow fever, and malaria. 
They can also kill bees, wasps, or ants that can cause allergic reactions. Insecticides can protect animals from illness that can be caused by parasites such as fleas. Pesticides can prevent sickness in humans that could be caused by moldy food or diseased produce. Herbicides can be used to clear roadside, weeds, trees, and brush. They can also kill invasive weeds that may cause environmental damage. Herbicides are commonly applied in ponds and lakes to control algae and plants such as water grasses that can interfere with activities like swimming and fishing and cause the water to look or smell unpleasant. Uncontrolled pests such as termites and mold can damage structures such as houses. Pesticides are using grocery stores and food storage facilities to manage rodents and insects that can infest foods such as grain. Each use of a pesticide carries some associated risk. Proper pesticide use decreases these associated risks to a level deemed acceptable by pesticide regulatory agencies such as the United States Environmental Protection Agency or the EPA and the Pest Management Regulatory Agency or the PMRA of Canada. Okay, we'll come back to that last part about risk a little bit later. At least I think I do in the, in the script. <laughs> anyway, so besides the benefits listed just now, here are some agricultural benefits. So improved crop yields, save money by preventing crop losses, an estimated fourfold return on investment. Non-use will reduce crop yields by 10%. Doesn't seem like a lot, but if you add up that across all agriculture, that's, a significant, that's significant to the food supply. Improved crop or livestock quality, invasive species controlled, prevents higher food prices, prevents job loss, prevents an increase in world hunger. Let's talk about world hunger for a minute. Yes, that can easily be its own set of videos, and I'm not the person to do that. I'll say this, according to the Huffington Post, they reported back in 2012 that a McGill University and University of Minnesota study estimated that we grow enough food for 10 billion, with a B, people. So what's the problem? Essentially access. Much of the world that needs it most faces a combination of three problems. And this is an oversimplification, by the way. They don't create it. They don't create enough for the local population. They can't afford it. That last part is a major factor for countries that just don't have the economic resources to supply food to their populations. Whether it's the government's lack of funds or the majority of the population. Additionally, according to the HuffPost article and not the necessarily the twin university study, quote, the bulk of industrially produced grain crops goes to biofuels and can find animal feed lots rather than food for the 1 billion hungry. The call to double food production by 2050 only applies if we continue to prioritize the growing of population of livestock animals and automobiles over hungry people, end quote. So even those crops being used elsewhere isn't preventing supply. While it sounds like a pretty negative statement, you can also read it as it's helping with the amount of food is available, as in providing livestock and even with the ability to transport it via vehicles. Though they choose to use the word automobile, with, which conjures the image of cars rather than delivery trucks. But that's still part of the problem, the lack of food distribution. I've linked to the HuffPost article in the description, or the actual PDF for it, so read more about it. I've also linked to the study as published in Nature. So you're more than welcome to spend the money to get access to it. That's the, the university study. Let's get back on track. Pesticides have allowed the world to increase the food supply. This also includes grapes for wine. They have allowed more vineyards to be planted. They are providing protection to those vineyards as well. Much of the wine we have today wouldn't be here without them. So pesticides are a good thing. Again, they're gonna be too much of a good thing. Let's talk about the issues or dangers, if you will, I told you I'd get to it, with pesticides. First, it should go without saying that the manufacture and handling of these is pretty dangerous. Not that the manufacture of fertilizers isn't either. Pesticides contain a lot of toxic substances, so you definitely need to be careful. All it takes is a quick glance at the back of a can of bug spray to see that. This is a real concern when it comes to using them in the vineyard. The effect on those working the vineyard is very important. There are many vineyards where the use of various pesticides is extensive. I can only infer this based on nothing more than hearsay, but assuming, and I know that's dangerous in more ways than one, industrial wine growing follows similar paths with industrial farming, in order to protect their crop, these very large vineyards are going to spray. Not necessarily all the time, but will do it as much as they need to in order to ensure a good crop. Much of this is mechanized, so it's not like there are hundreds of people hand spraying, 
but even sitting in the farm equipment doing the spraying has got to be hazardous. For the small wine grower, especially those that actually live on the same property, they are only going to use these products when necessary. They understand the dangers more than anyone else. So they don't want to poison themselves, their employees or their families. Some additional issues with using pesticides. All right, pesticides reportedly only reach an estimated two to 5% of their target species. The remaining go to non-target species, air and water. Air distribution is called pesticide drift and it can affect neighboring vineyards, especially troublesome for vineyards that either don't need it or don't practice conventional farming. Water pollution is a concern as some pesticides persist for a long time. Reduction in biodiversity, reduction in pollination, habitat destruction, threats to endangered species, increased resistance within a species to pesticides, after harvest residue getting into the food chain. Pretty scary stuff, huh? Yeah, so in my travels, I've talked with a few winemakers and wine growers about this stuff. Not all of them, mind you, as either the subject never came up or it was pretty obvious they don't use conventional farming. However, with those that do, the last part is of utmost concern to them. They don't want residue to get into the wine. In many cases around the world, the use of pesticides is regulated as far as how close to harvest you can use them, not just for the grapes. The wine grower needs to be conscious of these negative effects to the vineyard and the surrounding environment. And I can say that the few that I've talked to are, or at least they appeared to be to me. I'm a pretty trusting person, so if you tell me you're going to do something, I initially believe you, within reason. I have a few more things to add. While not exclusive to conventional farming, there are some other things that are associated with it. One is soil compaction. This is also known as soil structure degradation, and is the increase of bulk or density or decrease in porosity of soil due to externally or internally applied loads, also known as farm equipment. This is also tied to erosion. The more compact the soil is, the harder it is for water to be absorbed from rainfall. This causes runoff and erosion. Plus, the runoff will contain any chemicals that haven't degraded sufficiently to be rendered harmless. And if I haven't been clear about it, the use of all these chemicals, especially in a monocrop environment, affects the fertility of the soil. In many cases, you'll find less biodiversity or just plain life in soils where conventional farming has been practiced for years, even decades. It's a bit of a snowball effect that these soils might, not necessarily in every case, but might need progressively higher amounts of fertilizer and other soil adjustments that I didn't cover here. So what does this all mean? Well, the explosion in the supply of wine over just the past 50 years is directly related to the use of fertilizers and pesticides along with irrigation. Just like a lot of things, we are in a balancing act of do the positives significantly outweigh the negatives? And who's deciding that balance? You can choose to seek out organic, biodynamic, sustainable, regenerative, or even natural wine. Not all of these are without their issues. And just remember my example from earlier. You ever see that person at the store that asks for something organic or natural, yet they are obviously not fully invested in this concept? Drinking that Diet Coke from a plastic bottle, eating that national brand whatever, wearing clothing with another national brand that may have some questionable practices? Yeah, it's good to be concerned about knowing where your wine comes from and how it's made. Hell, that's why I'm making these series of videos. But we all make compromises in our lives as to what's important. Maybe it is wine that's not made use convent using conventionally farmed grapes, but you're okay with conventionally farmed tomatoes. I'm down with that. I make my own seemingly hypocritical compromises too. Just about all of us do. Just be true to yourself. Let's talk about labor costs when it comes to conventional farming in relation to vineyards. While using machines in the vineyard isn't exclusive to this type of farming, the larger the vineyard, the more likely the vineyard will be machine harvested. It's a fact of life. These vast vineyards that are responsible for those value wines have to do machine harvest. This saves money, big time. This is a big reason why Cameron Sauvignon can be about $350 per ton in the Central Valley of California versus, you know, $6,000, $6,500 in Napa. The land value is a big factor also, but those smaller vineyards elsewhere that are hand harvested will be more per ton in value. Higher rent districts along with higher labor costs will contribute to the price of those grapes. Places without large migrant worker populations such as Australia and New Zealand rely heavily on machine harvesting. Just to reiterate, machine harvesting is not exclusive to conventional farming, but it's also a big part of it. Also, conventional farming isn't exclusive to large vineyards either. It's found at all levels. 
I don't, don't come away from this video all depressed and feeling like you can't trust what's in that wine bottle. Conventional farming provides a lot of good things for us if it's used responsibly. That's the key. While it's easy to paint large corporations as evil, they are run by people, sometimes not so nice people who only care about themselves, but still people. If nothing else, they are looking at their bottom line and the overuse or waste of these products hurts the bottom line. It's in their best interest to be safe. And I know not all of them are gonna do that, but it's in their best interest to be safe. Now I'm not saying they're not gonna push these limits in order to protect that bottom line, just know that they are also weighing the positives and negatives. Their goals just may not align with yours and mine. Find reputable wineries. Rely on that sommelier or person at the wine shop. I like to call them retail psalms. While we may not have the entire inside scoop, we do hear things. We hear about those wineries that are doing it right. Even those that rely on or use conventional farming for most or all their grapes. Okay, enough about conventional farming. It was pretty intense, right? Get it? Intensive farming? Yeah, I'm not gonna win, up, win any stand-up comedian awards. Next week, we'll take a deep dive into conventional wine making. I hope you got value from this episode. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe, and then tell you all your friends, and until next time.